Hey everyone, this is Eric Bond, the founder of Beat the GMAT, and welcome to the second night of our seminar series on the new GMAT's Integrated Reasoning section. Uh, so for those of you who are not in the know, I got some big news for you. Next month there's going to be a change to the GMAT. So there's a new section that's that added called Integrated Reasoning. And it's very different from the traditional sections tested on the GMAT. And so this week, uh, every night at 8 o'clock Eastern Time, we're asking the world's top experts on uh, GMAT test prep to come visit us and share their knowledge and deep dive on an individual section of uh, integrated reasoning. And tonight, um, I'm very excited to be joined by Brian Galvin, who is the director of academic programs at Veritas Prep, uh, i.e. he is the top expert uh, within that company. And uh, he's going to be deep diving uh, a, a specific section of integrated reasoning called uh, graphic interpretation, and this is a very unique section. Uh, a little bit of background on on Brian. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, he's the top uh, curriculum developer and uh, subject matter expert on the GMAT at Veritas Prep. Uh, he also, you know, of course, has a 99th percentile GMAT score, but also uh, a number of other accomplishments, such as an NBA, an NBA championship ring. You know, Brian, you're not that tall, but, uh, you know, I, I'll believe it when I see it. And additionally, he's... Uh, I tell people I was the kicker. <laughs> exactly. Uh, perfect. I love that response. And also, I know that he is um, uh, an Ironman uh, finisher in the past, and this year he's gunning for an even better Ironman performance. So uh, that's pretty exciting. Maybe you can mention that a little bit. Uh, not only that, of course, uh, Brian has uh, co-authored many of Veritas Prep's lessons. Uh, he's responsible for uh, the books that uh, are produced by Veritas Prep, and as our community knows, those are some of the best resources available on GMAT Test Prep. And uh, he's taught many, many students um, uh, in the LA region where he's based, as well as uh, worldwide. So, Brian, thank you so much for spending your time this evening with us, and uh, the floor is yours. Hey, thanks, Eric, and um, I appreciate the, the intro. I don't know about the, uh, the chief expert. One of the things that hopefully everybody figures out in, uh, in business school is, uh, is management is the art of exploiting the talents of others, and so um, hopefully I'm just pretty good at blending what, uh, what all of our instructors do and um, turning it into something uh, that much more useful. But um, appreciate the intro and uh, excited to be able to, to do this um, for everyone here. Um, graphics interpretation is, is pretty interesting. Um, question type, and we'll talk a little bit about why um, as, uh, as we start getting there. I'm sharing the screen. Let me uh, move this over so we get the whole screen up here. Um, this is the online classroom that we use and where I feel comfortable with all the tools, so um, we're getting into that. Before we dive fully in, um, and I know you guys, a lot of you did the, um, the intro the other day, um, one quick thing I did want to call out before we get there, um, not just on all the basics, but um, is this idea that integrated, really, integrated reasoning really is integrative reasoning. And I know a lot of people, I've done a few of these seminars um, through just the, the Veritas website and, and all that, and we've heard quite a few people um, mention that they're intimidated by the new section, they're worried about the new section, and we hear the word new come up quite a bit. And one of the things we're trying to encourage everyone is to sort of reframe that thinking. It's not new, it's just integrated. They're taking some math skills, some verbal skills, and putting them together so that um, you have to use them both together a little bit more. But really, there's a lot of critical reasoning to it, assessing whether conclusions are valid or not. We'll do a lot of that tonight. A lot of that logic is used through the lens of math, which is what data sufficiency is in quite a, quite a few ways. Just like with reading comprehension, you're sorting a lot of information and being question stem driven, figuring out where to go to find the information that you particularly need um, problem solving, calculating numbers, seeing if you can get away without calculating numbers is there. So really, integrated reasoning is integrated reasoning. It's not as much new, it's just a new twist on the same types of thought processes that you've been using. And so if anyone studied for the test before um, and you know, now realizes they're going to have to take the test uh, within a, you know, after the next two weeks and they're going to get this quote unquote new section, everything you've done thus far will help you on integrated reasoning. And any integrated reasoning study you do will help you on the other sections because you're sharpening those reasoning skills, reasoning using number skills, all those kinds of things. And so um, I do think that's important to get out. We'll, we'll come back to that quite a bit, even with graphics interpretation. Um, 
And then one other thing, I know Eric mentioned the, uh, the Ironman um, triathlon type thing. I do also want to highlight, before we dive all the way in, that um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the concept of triathlon, but it uh, basically goes swim, which is the shortest portion for everyone, bike, which tends to be the longest and the most technical, um, maybe the most dangerous and, and the most opportunity for mechanical failure or anything like that, and then run where you're just kind of hanging on. And I think the GMAT's very, very similar, um, where the used to be just the AWA, now AWA and IR come first. They're a little bit shorter than the other two sections, a little bit more of a warm-up, not as important to your overall score or to your overall performance. Um, then you get to the math, which I think is what people study the hardest for, like kind of most people on the triathlon study most for, uh, for the, the, um, the quant. And then get onto the verbal, where part of it is just a war of attrition. Can you keep your stamina about you and, uh, and do what you're going to do? With triathlon, there's a big axiom, and actually I have a, a former training partner when I swam in high school, uh, actually pretty near where, uh, where Eric grew up too. I had friends who was a few years older than me but ended up being an Olympic swimmer and triathlete, and at the first ever Olympic triathlon in 2000, she led coming out of a swim, still lost the race because as everyone knows in triathlon, you can't win the race on the swim, you can only lose it there. If you completely bomb it and have an awful performance or if you waste so much stamina and energy that you just don't have it left for the back. And so one other thing about integrated reasoning, even though a lot of you may spend every night this week in one of these seminars, recognize that it's a lot like the swim in a triathlon. You're not going to win the GMAT on, on integrated reasoning. You're not going to get into business school on the strength of that score. Your job is really to not get a terrible score, get a competitive, you know, an all right score, and to make sure that you use it as a good warm-up for the rest of the test. And so the fact that it's integrated this way, sharpening your mind and, and getting you a good warm-up, you can use it to your advantage, but um, know that you're not going to win or lose um, the, the GMAT on this section as long as you don't totally bomb it or you don't let it uh, ruin the rest of your day. Now with all that said, the integrated reasoning isn't all that new. I'm, I'm happy that I get to go through really the only new skill set for integrated reasoning is graphics interpretation. Um, Eric and I were on some calls uh, with the, the Graduate Management Admissions Council um, over the last couple of weeks. So they even had mentioned business school faculty called for integrated reasoning. It wasn't as much admissions. It was faculty. They wanted people to be better prepared for practical decision making in business school. And I love data sufficiency. I don't know about you guys, but you can argue that it's not as practical as it could be for business decision making. Interpreting charts graphs, tables, that kind of thing is pretty practical and is the kind of thing that you're going to need to be able to do in business school. And so there is a little bit of a new skill to this, uh, but it's one of those that will not only make you a little bit better on the rest of the test, but will, will help you out in business school. And so I want to talk a little bit about um, kind of a skill builder on types of graphs and paying attention to, uh, to some of the subtlety that will come with some of these graphs. And so these are a few that, that we came up with. Um, by interpreting some of the, uh, the graphs that we saw on um, official guide questions and some of the official release questions, and also just noting some of the bad decisions that I've seen some of my coworkers and friends make based on graphs that uh, kind of coincide with some of the stuff we've seen on the official questions. Here we just have sort of a basic bar graph where they're going to try and chart two different metrics, integrated reasoning percentile and overall percentile um, based on your various house prep students, the entire pool, and then one of the competitors that did not get invited to do these, Gary's GMAT Emporium. And what's interesting is, like I mentioned, a lot of this is critical reasoning. It's paying attention to subtlety and wording, those kinds of things. Can we draw this first conclusion that various house prep students outperform the average student on both the integrated reasoning section and the GMAT as a whole? And I'm not sure we can see, we've got a lot of people in here, people close to 200. Hey, um, hey, not sure, we can, can we take polls here? Yeah. Uh, just wanted to uh, interject that and see whether there's a full screen mode. Uh, it seems like some people are having a little bit of problem with doing that. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, okay, go to full screen, I see that here. Right, I did see that. I saw that before, and then, okay, here we go. Oh, no, it's just a screen share. Um, Oh, okay. So um, I think we we're talking about in the Illuminate system, but it appears that this is probably the the the, the breadth of the screen, right? Yeah. Uh, here, I, I think I can fix that, though, actually. Um, 
Okay. Well, uh, for folks out there too, just uh, another tip is in go to go to meeting. You can actually expand the size of the viewing window, and if you have a larger screen, that may help as well. Um, but uh, we'll see what Brian can come up with as well. Yeah. Here, let me. Um, all right, this will look ugly for a sec. But um, here, I'll just. I think I can do it this way. Just get the whole screen like this, <laughs> and then. Is there like a laser? There's got to be a laser point of view, right? Um, At least in your arrow will work, I think, during the presentation mode, yeah. Oh, that's right. Okay, yeah. So we can just do that then. Um, so yeah. Okay. All right, thanks, Brian. Okay, so we'll go through this. Sorry, thanks, everybody, for, uh, for those comments. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it looks... <laughs> the instructor screen through that Illuminate thing is, uh, is different from what the students see. So we'll just go through the uh, the presentation this way. So um, if you see the graph, hopefully it's a little bit clearer now. Um, you can note that um, – here, actually, get the, um, the chat open just so I can make sure I see what's, uh, what everybody's saying here. Um, cool. All right. So – they ask the question, they ask, is this conclusion valid that Ferris House Prep students outperform the average student? I think if you look at it, because this is based on their scores, right, in terms of percentile, you can conclude this. These bars are higher than all of the other bars. But what about this second one? Can you infer that Ferris House Prep does a better job of um, teaching these concepts than even lowly Gary's GMAT Emporium? And I'm not sure. One other, if you, if you see, I don't, I don't know if I can see responses to any of these. I don't know if I'm supposed to. Um, try to keep it interactive. But I'll, uh, I can do yes, that. certain we can, actually. Why don't I make a, a quick little change here awesome. in real time. You should actually now see an area called questions. So uh, for folks, folks in the audience, um, you know, if Brian actually makes a question, writes a question, feel free to chat in a response. And uh, Brian, in the tr in the questions view, you should be able to see people's responses. Okay, I got it now. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. So with the second one, even though based on the bars at first visual glance, you're able to see, yeah, of course, they're you know they must be better. We can't draw that inference because this graph has nothing to do with teaching concepts. All it is is final scores. And so it may be that people who are predisposed to doing well pick Veritas Prep. People who are not predisposed to doing well pick Gary's. Gary's may do a better job of teaching it, but the graph only shows the final scores. And what this gets to, hopefully it's sort of a baseline type example here, but this is more of a critical reasoning question. Just instead of a paragraph, you got a graph. And so what the graphs are able to get people to do is to infer more than that's there, but the very same skills of paying attention to quick precision in wording, precision in language, like you do in difficult critical reasoning questions, um, you're going to need to be able to do here. Oftentimes, the legend and the scale are more important than the graph itself. The graph is a visual representation of the wording and the numbers that are actually a little bit more important. So where the test can get things past you is by hiding crucial information in the legend or the key um, and then asking you what seems like, just based on a quick glance, would be a reasonable, reasonable conclusion, but you need to do a little bit deeper of investigation. So it's really critical reasoning with a graphic prompt and not a text prompt. But whatever text is there is that much more important now because that's what's going to be able to match that precision in language that you now can do. Now another example here, me on that. Just one other example here. We actually have a, a guy in our office that does this every time he does a presentation. And I don't know if it's devious, but if you were to look at this graph, can you infer that my GMAT score is that much higher than your GMAT score? Because based on those bars, it looks like I just insanely trounced you. But what's the problem with the graph as it's given? Yeah. The scale is way off. I mean, to have a two-point scale on a test that's only graded in 10-point increments is pretty obtuse. And then it goes, it only goes to 800, 
and there's only a one, really one increment difference here. So even though it looks as though my score, in this case, is twice as high as yours, they're actually pretty similar. And so one other thing that's important to note, sort of like with geometry questions, if it doesn't say, or if it says that it's uh, not drawn to scale, then you have to infer the fact that it's probably a different visual than you got. Or if you happen to draw isosceles triangles every time you start to go to work on your noteboard, you need to be aware that it might not be an isosceles triangle, and it could be an obtuse triangle or uh, an equilateral triangle, or something else that's not exactly what you drew, uh, drew down. Here, pay attention to scale. And uh, I have it a few slides later, but I don't know if anybody here has an iPhone with the stock application. But I noticed this the other day. I was doing one of these workshops for, for a few of our students. And even just pulled that out. I'll, I'll show you that graph in, uh, in just a second. It's designed so that whatever happens in the market that day, the, the line graph on that iPhone app, it's just kind of a stock one that comes on the, the first um, scroll page of all those, will use the entire height of the screen. So even if nothing happened in the market that day, and it was the, the price of the Dow stayed within a dollar, it will look like it was a turbulent day. And that's something where certain graphs are just, that's the way they're presented. They have to, to fit a certain size in a newspaper or a presentation. And so, because in business, people may do this to try to bait you toward a certain interpretation. That's why faculty members call for a test like this. You're a little bit more responsible for the numbers and the words than you might think, even though the visual is going to be something that could be skewed a little bit to get you to draw a different conclusion. So pay attention to those kind of things. It really is critical reasoning, and you need to dive a little bit deeper um, to make sure that um, you're getting all the information and not just the one twisted uh, visual that, that they may have given you. So a couple common, um, another quick question here. Is everybody seeing the, uh, my control panel thing here covering up these questions? I can probably hide it. Um, let's see if I can get that down. There are a few types of questions, or graphs, I'm sorry, that we want to make sure people have seen. And these bubble charts um, from people that we talked to that um, took the sample questions on the test back uh, last summer when you could take sample integrated reasoning after your official test, numerous people commented that they saw these and hadn't really been mentally prepared for them and had to do some work. Quite a few of these have come up in some of the official guide questions and everything. These bubble charts are an interesting type of graph, and so I want to make sure that, that everybody's at least familiar with these. And then we'll talk about these inferences as well. This is a way to represent three dimensions of data in a two-dimensional plane. So in this case, um, we're looking at you know, the title is earnings potential versus climate um, in MBA admissions. The y-axis is average starting salary, and all this is given to you in the legend. And that's why I mentioned that legend is so important. The x-axis is average uh, temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. And then the bubbles, this is where you want to be really careful. The bubbles here represent the ratio of uh, applications received to acceptances granted. Right? So the bigger the bubble, arguably the more selective the school, the lower percentage of people that apply that they actually admit. So bigger bubbles up here show that they may get, um, you know, say 10 applications for every one person they admit, smaller, maybe one or two applications for every person that they admit. And so these bubble charts are a way to be able to represent three forms of data in a two-dimensional fashion. So pretty useful, probably see quite a few of these in, uh, in business and business school, and there's a very high likelihood you'll see something like this on the test. Now again, pay attention to where they're trying to get your mind to go. If we look at this one conclusion here, this first one, um, and we ask these how many conclusions are logically supported, a lot of these questions take this form where any one of them could be yes or no, and they'll have the radio buttons to be able to click that. Can we draw this conclusion that schools with average starting salaries above 100,000, so um, toward the top of this year, receive more applicants than those that have a lower starting salary? So the bubbles are bigger up top. And here's where, again, it's more of a reading comprehension exercise than I think people would admit. And one of the things we want to sell to you is that a lot of times it goes to what's in the legend and what's in the question. Here, it's not the number of applicants. 
this school here may be very uh, selective. It could be one of those schools that they only have 10 spots a year. They're highly sought after, and the application fee is insanely high, so they only get 50 applicants. Very selective, whereas this other one may be 10,000 applicants for 9,000 spots at a, you know, an online school or something like that. We can't infer number. All we know is that proportion of how many apply versus um, how many are accepted. We just know that particular ratio. And so one is not supported. Two is supported because it goes back to that ratio, turn away a greater percentage of their applicant pool. So this you have to do a little bit of reading comprehension to recognize that it says exactly the same thing here just as the legend, just in different words. Don't be swayed by size of bubbles, size of bars, volatility in a line graph. Make sure you're paying attention to the precision in wording here. So even this last one here, average starting salary is the most important factor that applicants consider. Recognize that they can only display three types of data here. Earnings potential, climate, and then um, selectivity or you know, that ratio of applications to anything else. We don't know. It could also be cost of the MBA, um, potential for um, financial aid, all kinds of other factors um, that could go into it. The other limitation to a lot of these graphs is that they may look as though it gives a clear picture of everything that's going on because they are eye-catching and well-organized. However, here, even though they can give you three dimensions, we can't infer that those are the only three dimensions. And so this last one is also not supported. So pay attention to the legend. It still is critical reasoning. Um, the graph is helpful for a visual, but you need to dive deeper into the data. And that's really that, that trick between statements uh, or, or inferences one and two. And then also recognize, even when it's three-dimensional, that's still only three dimensions that they can display, and there could be more in play. So those are bubble charts, and, uh, and then a little bit more on that um, critical reasoning philosophy behind all this. So um, make sure that uh, you take that away and, and get used to some of the more common types of, of charts that they can use. You guys have seen Venn diagrams before. Um, hopefully with, uh, with problem solving um, and, uh, and data sufficiency type questions. Here it's another type of, uh, of graphic that we know that they've tested in uh, some of the samples uh, you know, both last summer and some of the things that they released online. The important things to note with these, I think it is kind of interesting that um, a lot of people use Venn diagrams to organize information for problem solving problems where you create the diagram. Here they're sort of having you do the inverse. They're going to give you the diagram and then see, do you know it from the other side? And, uh, and this is one that's been sort of surprising, um, how even students that are pretty good with problem solving problems, when they're given the diagram, um, struggle to, uh, to interpret all of it. Remember that the use for Venn diagram is to be able to, um, to visually represent overlapping sets. And so in this case, um, we have MBA applicants from a particular firm. Some used an admissions consultant. Some were admitted to their first choice school. The six that are in this group here did both, used an admissions consultant and were admitted. And then remember, there's also a neither group. In a lot of the, the problem solving data sufficiency type questions, that neither group tends to be where, uh, where a lot of people get tripped up. That could well be the case on, on a lot of these visually represented classes as well, or um, questions as well. And so, when they ask this question here, what percent of applicants were admitted to their first choice school? First, you need to recognize that these six over here are only those who were admitted and did not use an admissions consultant. These six in the middle fit both categories. So really, there are 12 that were admitted out of a total of, and you have to add in the other eight, not just these three, then neither is count as well. So it was 12 out of 20 for 60%. Um, so recognizing that um, the overlapping set gets counted in both circles is important. Um, but these six are only group B. These three are only group A. But if you want group A as a total, it's these nine. If you want group B as a total, it's these 12. Um, and so being able to visually represent all that is uh, pretty important. And then for question two, we'll just kind of throw it out as, a, as an open question. Um, this one it was actually a closer call when I first wrote this one, and then our director of admissions consultant got ticked off that I made it seem like it was negligible difference that admissions consultants offered. Um, but if you wanted to calculate, were those who used an admissions consultant more or less or as likely, um, we'll say that 
six out of the nine who used an admissions consultant got in, and then those who didn't are anybody outside of the circle. And so six out of, if you add in the five, 11 didn't use it but were admitted. Um, and here's where I also want to give a little bit of a sales pitch for, um, because it's hard to sell someone on not doing something, but for not using that calculator. Um, one other thing I've seen a lot of students express relief at is, oh, finally we get to use the calculator. And one thing I would urge everyone to do is avoid using that calculator unless the numbers are too close to call. Here, when you're comparing 6 out of 9 versus 6 out of 11, you shouldn't have to do that math. You should know that 6 out of 9, same numerator, smaller denominator, that's going to be the higher. So the answer is going to be more likely. One of the things, I don't have it um, actionable to be able to pop up right now in here, um, it actually drove our computer programmer crazy. Uh, he's a math major from UCLA, really sharp guy, great with math, also a great programmer. Um, and he was even uh, just bummed out. He's like, I can't believe they're on-screen calculators because we had him go through the official stuff. Doesn't recognize order of operations, kind of clunky to use. Um, you know, people are going to be held, taken to task for typos because they're not going to be, it's not like Excel where you can go back and look at your algorithm and see, oh, right, I added a zero here. That wasn't the number I meant to type, or it should have been in parentheses or something like that. So the other thing I'd recommend off of this one is be careful. Just because you have a calculator doesn't mean that you should use the calculator. When calculations are too close to call, then you may want to go to it instead of doing long division or multi-digit multiplication by hand. But um, know that it's a tool that you may use once or twice, but that you shouldn't use on every question because that relative type math, not actually doing the math, but being able to use number properties, estimates, those kind of things to do it for you, is something you'll still be rewarded for quite a bit on this test. So I um, wanted to also get that out in, uh, in going through this one. And, uh, and then to summarize, um, Venn diagrams is another type of uh, question that you're responsible for or graph you're responsible for, sorry. These scatter plots are another one that, that we've seen quite a few questions come up on and uh, we weren't sure that, uh, you know, that everyone is uh, fully adept at being able to, to recognize these scatter plots. What these are for is to plot individual data points, and you'll see those based on uh, all these um, blue dots, or I guess diamonds all over here. Show a general trend, and uh, these regression lines don't necessarily take in, or, you know, they don't, don't have to bend. Um, regression lines by nature are a straight line. You can also give a little bit of a parabola or anything for it. And most of these that we've seen on anything official just have a straight line. And their, their goal is to be able to plot a bunch of data points and then have you ask you questions about general trends or any of those kind of things. Here's where one of the things you're going to need to have the skill to be able to do is segment the data, be able to, to kind of draw in your own mental lines on the computer screen and all that kind of thing. For example, um, this first question says, all sur students sur surveyed who studied less than 45 hours scored below average. Really what this comes down to is being able to segment the graph. If you look at um, the, um, the legend will tell you what the values are. The, um, the x-axis is hours of preparation and the y-axis is overall score. If you can just segment the graph and say, really all I care about if it's students who studied less than 45 hours is Oh, no. yeah. anyone to the left of sort of this imaginary vertical line, as soon as you see one that's well above average and definitely below 45 hours, you know that this is not valid. And so a lot of what you'll end up doing on a lot of these graphs is, one, recognizing it's on a computer screen so you can't draw, but two, being able to mentally segment what happens below 45 and above 45, those kind of things. And you'll even see um, same similar construct in, uh, in question two, um, was the average score greater for those who studied more than 50 hours or 50 or less? Here you can use a little bit of the regression line, basically you're going to segment again here and recognize that you have one outlier well above average, everything else pulls you down below 50, and then above 50, there's a huge cluster of points up here. So it will be for those who studied more higher. Again, you don't want to calculate, and the test won't make you calculate. Here, I think there are 36 total data points. You're not going to want to run an average. Uh, but if you can segment and make reasonable inferences off of these graphs, uh, you should be able to do so as well. 
This third one I think is kind of interesting. Um, can you conclude that studying for more than 150 hours, if you see kind of where the trend stops to really hold is right around 150 and then the uh, trend drops down a little bit more, which actually I like having that on here because that is what, uh, what GMAX research tends to support as well. This was um, you know, kind of a quick scatter plot to try to replicate some of the data that, uh, that they publish. Um, can we conclude three? This again is one of those cases where the trend may support if you're just looking at points, but precision in wording and really understanding exactly what the graph is telling you should show you we don't know who these people over here were. We don't know what their score would have been had they studied for 90 hours or 110 hours or 130 hours. It could be that they needed all that time to get to this point. And so again, this question here is designed to show you a little bit of the limitation of just looking at visual data. Um, one of the things that the test is, uh, is pretty good at in a critical reasoning context and they'll continue to do with integrated reasoning is give you enough validation to let your mind run wild with something that could be true but isn't necessarily true. And so when you're asked to draw uh, conclusions on critical reasoning questions, any inference-based questions, draw conclusion questions, your standard of proof is that it must be true. Same thing is true on graphics interpretation, um, table analysis, any of those, and if the, the line of reasoning goes a little bit further than the scope of what's actually given, you need to be able to recognize that. And one of my predictions on this, we see, um, we, we talk to students about some of the official questions and, and some of the new things on practice sets and everything, is that there is something about statistical information and graphical information that almost suggests to people that they should turn that critical part of their mind off a little bit. Um, probably, you may have noticed, I don't say you probably noticed, you may have noticed in as you've gone from official guide 11 to 12 to 13, if anybody's been around in the pipeline for that much or have upgraded books, um, I'm sure Eric and uh, the team at, at Beat the GMAT have seen over time a little bit of an evolution. Um, critical reasoning questions have evolved to include more and more statistical um, premises leading to conclusions. I think because GMAC has sort of caught on to that fact that we're very susceptible to bad decisions when we're presented with data. Um, and this is something like I mentioned at the top, uh, one of the jobs of a manager is to exploit the abilities and talents of those working for them. Not that cruelly, but you gotta find what your team can do and encourage them to do that to make you look better. In business, you can exploit this for sure. That um, when, when people are presented with numbers or graphs, they tend to accept blindly whatever conclusion you ask them to do. Know that that's part of what you're susceptible to and, uh, and be careful with that kind of a thing. And so um, you know, question three here is an example of that where based on the data you can look at and say, yeah, it seems like you know, for a long time if people study up above 100 hours, even as many as 140 some hours, they tend to do better but then it falls off a little bit. You can infer reasons for that that we don't have anything to back up. So, um, be careful of, uh, of kind of taking some of those conclusions um, as given. Keep that critical reading part of your mind turned on. And then this fourth one, I want to show how some of these decisions can be close, but if you really think about them, um, they, uh, they will be pretty fair. On average, did the students surveyed who studied for more than 70 hours perform better than those who studied for less? And so again, you'll want to segment the graph a little bit. This vertical line I'm trying to draw here, is about 70 hours. And if you look, when you segment it right at this line, there are only one or two, out, two outliers that would pull the average up, and they're pretty easily mitigated by those below the overall average, which goes to show that <coughs> everything above here, that weighted average, is going to pull out that this, this will end up being significantly above the overall average. Everything left of that 70 line is going to end up pretty darn close to that average, even if not um, just a little bit below or right on it. And so even though it's somewhat close, you still don't want to do the math. Um, think critically and, and force yourself to, uh, to make those decisions. These we've seen be a little bit tricky um, for people because sort of people want to do the math and know that they can't. Um, the test is pretty good at being fair, but you know, uh, making it close. Um, and so this is an example of that. So 
um, one of the skills that uh, we've been teaching people to do is really to be able to segment the graph and uh, look at it in, in two parts. Um, and, and in this case, if you kind of use that dividing line, again, you have to be able to draw it kind of visually in your mind, but um, you can make some inferences that way too. So those are a few popular types of graphs that uh, you'll want to be used to seeing. Here is, I wanted to show this here. This is just today's NASDAQ line graph. I don't think we fully covered line graphs. This is what I was talking about, where even, you know, I think the, the my GMAT score, your GMAT score one, um, you know, I kind of created to be a little bit diabolical. Um, but this is actually, you know, Apple created this for, uh, for the iPhone or some web developer, and they approved it. And if you look, I don't think it was that turbulent a day um, on the NASDAQ trading floor. It closed within, you know, less than 30 points of where it started. Um, so pretty close, you know, not really, you know, maybe about a percent. I think it's about par for the course of the NASDAQ on any given day. But it looks pretty volatile um, given that this graph is designed to take up all the space. It's not unfair for the test to do that. Um, these are the types of graphs you'll be presented with in business, in business school, and need to be able to, to think critically. And so paying a t attention to the scale, to the legend, really recognizing that these are critical reasoning questions just with a graphic prompt and not a paragraph prompt. I think maybe the single most important factor in performing well with, uh, with graphics interpretation. Um, this is fair in, uh, in real life and, um, and it's just, just a case of you recognizing that and not allowing yourself to, uh, to be swayed by all that. So. And I also wanted to show, this is sort of a sales pitch. A lot of you have probably seen this graph as one of the examples that's given officially um, by the Graduate Management Admissions Council on the, uh, the MBA.com site, where this is one of those sort of chronological um, era type graphics. And uh, you need to, to recognize that um, this eon here is now called out um, as, as a you know, subset um, where they're going to magnify this era here on this graph, and then they're going to magnify again this um, small purple portion here. And so you'll need to recognize that these three are not to be taken as equals. The scale is important that these are in you know, that millions of years, whereas these are a much smaller increment. You kind of see where they come from. I bring this up to recognize that one of the skills you're going to need to build on this is you're going to need to get familiar with unique types of graphs or the ability to be able to see a graph and somewhat efficiently determine what it's asking you to do. So while we can teach a lot of bar graph, line graph, pie graph, scatter plot, bubble chart, the most common business types of graphs, GMAC has sort of tipped its hand here and said we want to be able to reward people who when presented with a new type of graphic can interpret the legend, can interpret kind of graphically what's going on, and then go back and make decisions. And so this is something you can improve in your day-to-day -day life by paying attention to graphs in you know, The Economist, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times. Just when you see graphics, take a little extra time to sort of interpret um, what they're asking you to do. Um, one thing we're asking a lot of our students to do now is find a graph that's a little bit misleading and then bring it into class and see if you can get somebody to fall for a sucker conclusion based on it. Sort of make that critical thinking, um, think like the test maker style your own, and see how certain graphs just sort of lend themselves to. I bet if somebody saw this in 10 seconds, they would draw this conclusion. So um, as much as possible, um, you know, again, the, the integrated reasoning section will not make or break you over the next couple months. But to be ready for it and, uh, and to be able to do so efficiently, pay attention to graphics as you see them come up. Um, in day-to-day -day life and at work as in your reading and those kind of things, um, some of what you're likely to see uh, won't necessarily be one of the major types of business graphs. It may be a sort of unique graph. Um, here's kind of a, uh, I don't even know how to turn it into an adjective, but something a paleontologist will use, paleontological um, type graph. And um, you know, it's just, just a matter of the test wants you, uh, the authors of the test, want you to be able to interpret some of these things. And so um, taking the practice task, going through some practice problems, sort of training your mind to be able to interpret graphs would be kind of important. And so to summarize, I think Eric and I talked about being done at quarter of, I think we'll hit it right uh, around the bat. The big takeaways that I think everybody needs to get out of this, whoops, are 
One, that graphics interpretation is critical reasoning. It's just more visual than textual. Um, more so than any other question type, there is a slightly new skill set here, and that's what I just talked about. Pay attention to graphics as you see them in newspapers, magazines, uh, websites at work, any of those kind of things. The biggest thing I can sell to anyone here is that you do need to pay attention to precision and wording. Um, I think a lot of people have a tendency to gloss over legends and scales and try to, to make inferences based on um, what's visual. And in kind of classic GMAT style where they know where your mind is going to go and they'll punish you for having it go there inefficiently, um, a lot of these questions will position the conclusion that looks one way visually, but when you go back to the legend, you'll recognize, wait a second, that's not precisely what this data gives me. Or you may make it look as though something's overwhelmingly true, but if you go back to the scale, you'll realize it's not as big a deal as you thought. Um, so be careful with the legend, the scale, and the axes. Know exactly what information is given you. That precision of wording is going to be big. And then we talked a little bit about with the Venn diagram. Um, use the idea of relative math. Ratios, number properties, uh, proportional type things, estimates. Um, that calculator um, is, is likely for a lot of people to be fool of gold. It'll be that thing that feels comfortable. Great, I can turn off my mind to use the calculator. But just given the primitive nature of that calculator compared with what you tend to use on a day-to-day -day basis with Excel and some of those other things um, that uh, you have at your disposal, um, it's, if you're not careful, that calculator could end up being more work than it's worth and, uh, and leading you toward either incorrect or sort of gibberish answers that you'll have to go back and fix. So um, the idea of relative math will be fairly important. So that's sort of a 45-minute rundown we think is, is pretty important with graphics interpretation. And if I can summarize with one more thing, recognize it's not that new other than the fact that you'll need to, to play around with, uh, with you know, different types of graphs, which could actually be um, sort of enjoyable. And you know, like I mentioned with the, the iPhone uh, example, um, I've sort of had fun just kind of picking graphs that I see in even in pretty reputable publications and saying, hey, you know, you can draw some pretty uh, irresponsible conclusions off of these. I bet this is something that the GMAT would test. So um, hopefully it's, it's beneficial and, and even enjoyable getting up to speed on all those. The other thing to take away from this is this will sharpen your mind for critical reasoning, for reading comprehension. And so if you do put some time into these, even just with practice tests and all, that time will pay off on the other sections. And, um, and make sure that that part of your mind, that critical um, portion of your mind is, is sharpened. Um, when you do this 30-minute section on test day, it's warming you up. If you see it as an opportunity, like I mentioned at the beginning, I think a lot of people see integrated reasoning right now as a threat. It's new. It's a little bit unknown, and so people that have to take the test in June or that tried to take the test last month and need to retake it and couldn't get a date until June or July feel that they're um, you know, being inconvenienced by this section. I think you can look at it as a matter of convenience. Instead of doing essays, which are a little bit more abstract, now you're doing this. You're getting to warm up your critical reasoning mind a little bit so that when it comes time to take those questions, or even data sufficiency questions, which are similar, you're on point and you're ready to go. So hopefully you can see this as, as an opportunity and a good warm up and uh, can go from there. So with all that said, I know we want to leave a little bit of time for, uh, for Q&A. So um, Eric, if you want to uh, take over that, let me get um, Sounds great. Uh, these windows back up. So thanks. Wonderful. Uh, so for those of you who arrived a little bit late, we're speaking with uh, Brian Galvin, who is the Director of Academic Programs at Veritas Prep. He just went through a, a really great presentation, a deep dive on graphics interpretation, which is a one of the new question types for the new integrated reasoning section that we're going to see on the GMAT, uh, I believe on June 5th, when they switch over to the new test format. Uh, so at this point, uh, we're going to go ahead and take a look at some of your audience questions that have been coming in. i um, been very pleased to see a lot of really great questions. Uh, Brian, so first question for you. Um, this is one that I really like. Uh, a few slides ago, you had showed uh, a, an example of a graph where uh, there were student study hours versus GMAT scores. And a few of the audience members wanted to know whether that was real data. <laughs> or was that just an example that uh, you made up? This, uh, just to get it to look like a scatter plot, um, I'm, I made up the individual data points. But this is, is pretty consistent with, um, there's a, a great graphic uh, that's at, I think it's gmac.com, mm -hmm. uh, gmac.com, 
um, where they do some of their interactive research where there is a point where after about 120 hours or so, um, the average scores do start to decline a little bit. And, uh, and so I, I wanted to bring that up a little bit. This is, this is going into uh, it's kind of our official lesson. So it gives an instructors a, an opportunity to talk to their students about preparing efficiently. Um, you know, I've always found, I, I, I tell a lot of our students and, uh, and a lot of people in the office are, are pretty big fans of this. It scares me more when someone says, I, I'm taking the next six months to study for the GMAT than when somebody says they're going to study for the next six weeks. Because I think sometimes when people think that doing more and just spending more time, it sounds right, but then it's, they use the time inefficiently because there's never that sense of urgency or that, um, that real desire to spend today making sure they conquer geometry or sentence correction or anything. It's sort of that kind of lulling yourself to sleep and, and doing problems. So the inspiration for the data is real. These actual data points are, are, are kind of made up, but uh, the inspiration is real, and that is one point that uh, I, I sort of give these so that we had an opportunity to make that point. But make sure that you use your time valuably because the, uh, the statistics do show that after a certain point, um, scores start to decline a little bit. That's right. I remember, Brian, actually sitting in the same room as you were uh, when, when GMAC presented this data to us uh, at the right. annual yeah. conference a few years ago. So uh, very good point. Uh, so related specifically to graphic interpretation questions, uh, I see, a, I see a, a message coming from Ronnie. How many graphic interpretation questions can we expect to encounter on the GMAT uh, on test day? So sh is there a rule of thumb that between two and four uh, of these types of questions will appear. Uh, any guidance in terms of the number of questions? Yeah, definitely. It's um, so, and I think we were on the same call when uh, when they were talking about that. There are twelve total questions, and there are four types. So, on average, you'd say three of each. Um, they say the content distribution is fixed, except for the fact that some are experimental. You probably infer that you're going to have two or three experimental unscored questions that don't count toward your score, but are there so that GMAT can, uh, can gather data on whether it's a difficult question or not, whether it's a fair question or not. Um, and so I would say because you don't know which experimentals, they, you know, there may be um, certain questions that are a little bit looser and they need to test more of them, especially early on, to uh, tighten them up a little bit or to, to refill the pool. Um, I'd say between two and four. I don't, I don't think there's much chance you'll see fewer than two. Um, just because if it's an even contest content distribution, you're probably going to see at least one of every type, and I would, I would argue two. Um, and then with the experimentals, you may see one or two more. My guess, actually, you guys will do the, the two-part analysis pretty soon. Mm -hmm. Those two-part analysis questions are basically problem-solving or critical reasoning questions, just mm -hmm. with more answer choices. I, and so I doubt they're going to need to test as many of those. So if you're going to see more of anything, my guess is that it would be more of these or of table analysis just because they're, they're newer looking um, and they may need to, to, to figure out which data pools or types of visuals are harder, easier. I think they'll need to gather a little more information on these. So you know, if there is one to expect to be a little bit on the high side, I'd say this would be a candidate kind of based on that idea that, that there, it may get a, a disproportionate share of the unscored experimental. I see a, a question coming in from Shal Mali, and uh, Shal Mali, my apologies if I mispronounced your name. Uh, so the question is, is there an exhaustive list of the type of graphs that we can expect on the IR section? Uh, can we expect graphs other than the three examples that you had shown, Brian? Good question, and, and that's the reason I did want um, to bring in this one here, um, to show that there really can't be an exhaustive list, because I think part of what they're testing is when you're presented with a new way of organizing information, are you able within a couple minutes to be able to get the gist of how it's presented and, and that kind of thing? So um, we tried to hit some of those that we found that uh, we know recurred enough in um, some of the stuff that they were testing last summer that students mentioned or, or some of our instructors mentioned um, that are on the official practice test and, and all those, the bubble charts, scatter plots, um, some of those that we know are, are kind of core business type graphs that, that people have seen and struggled a little bit with. We wanted to call those out specifically. Uh, sort of my, my reason for including this one was just to show I don't think you can get exhausted with it, but if you do a little bit of practice and just sort of get um, in the mindset of that skill of I'm presented with something new, but if I read the legend 
and then sort of take some visuals of how it's um, graphically presented, I can become familiar enough to answer the questions with whatever they do present. Related to this uh, question from Shal Mali, Brian, is a, a question I'm seeing from Sarah. Uh, what other publications can we review for exposure to the different types of graphs? Are there any Veritas prep resources for practice questions? Um, great question. We actually, and we're still doing more of it, trying to add more. Our integrated reasoning page, I think one of our, our goals, and, and, uh, and I think we still tout it, is we have more free practice questions than, uh, than anyone else out there. So even if you just Google Veritas Prep Integrated Reasoning, or even GMAT Integrated Reasoning, I think one of the other goals is to be on the first page for that. Um, you'll, uh, you'll see we have a bunch of sample questions just for free at our site, um, and so that's a, a good resource for that. Um, and then all of our, I think as of today, um, our practice tests are all integrated reasoning compatible, and so there's some more sample questions there. The official guide for GMAT review is great. Um, you kind of get uh, some insight into what they've tested and, and what they want to see. And, um, and then I found just even um, uh, using The Economist as a guide, just sort of anytime I'm reading that, kind of looking, hey, that's an interesting way that they've plotted information on a graph. I think, um, you know, this, this uh, paleontology style graph here, um, I think is what, it's going to be one of the outliers. My guess is, and this is just sort of understanding that, that business school faculty called for this and that uh, the GMAC is, is pretty concerned with making sure that it's an authentic type assessment, that you'll see more business style, you'll, you're guaranteed to see one or two business style graphs. And then you may see some outliers like this. Um, and so if you're using things like Business Week, The Economist, Forbes, any of those, and just sort of looking at anything that catches your eye as, hey, that's a unique type of graph. Um, you know, I wouldn't recommend making that a core subject of study, going to you know, the, the reading room at the Bryant Park Library and just going through every business publication you can get your hands on. But if you are reading those things or, or you know, have occasion if you're at the airport and you're between Us Weekly and The Economist, grab The Economist you know, and, you, and you'll, you'll benefit from seeing some of the, the different ways that they represent information that way. Hey, I've seen some pretty good charts in Us Weekly before, Brian. It's actually the second time it came up today we were talking about our uh, our office there's a uh, like a food court area down the street that is always in us weekly and it, I sheepishly had to admit that every once in a while I pick one up just to look to see if, if maybe I'm in the background in one of them so, <laughs> uh -huh. I understand <laughs> exactly all right well uh, uh, moving on to some more uh, audience questions and uh, less about uh, us weekly's latest uh, latest publication is there a correlation with Thank certain you. Yeah. So the question is: Is there a correlation with certain types of, um, with a? Let me see if I can understand. This. Is there a correlation with certain type of graph and difficulty level? Oh, okay. Uh, or different types of graphs that appear randomly during exam. So uh, uh, generally, the, this question is asking: Is the integrated reasoning section adaptive, and are we going to see harder graphs as we do better? Phenomenal question. Um, and this is one I didn't really even know the answer to until a couple weeks ago um, when we were on a call with uh, some reps from, uh, from GMAC, and they mentioned, uh, one, that the, um, it's not adaptive. So um, you won't, you know, if you're, you get the first three questions right, you know, question four still could be moderate or even easy. So it's not adaptive. Um, the other piece of insight that I thought was really valuable from that, that meeting we were in was that beginning in June, they're going to update the percentiles every month. And you can infer from that that they're still feeling out the difficulty level. And so over the next few months, um, my take on this is that you're more like maybe 40% of the reason you're taking the test is for business schools. 60% of it for the next couple of months is for GMAC so that they can learn about how, what types of graphs are you know, are, you know, specific to this, what types of graphs have the, the highest degree of difficulty, um, and which ones correlate best, even if it's a high degree of difficulty, say 85% of people get it wrong, but it's not the same 15% that get it right, that get above you know, 680 on the overall test, does that mean it's good? I think you're going to be doing a lot of research on um, which are good, fair, differentiating type questions. And then, I don't know if it was directly related to the question, but it kind of caught my ear as, as you were going through that. Um, the other thing that I, I think is going to be um, really paramount to this 
um, is being question stem driven. And it's not, uh, I don't get the opportunity to talk table analysis and some of those, but with, with both of these, um, what's more important is the question itself than the information that's given. Hmm. So the, what makes it hard is the question in most cases. And uh, I think we'll see that um, bear itself out a little bit. But there may be a little bit of a smoke screen with, hey, that's kind of a weird type of graph. It's going to take you 45 seconds or so to unravel what it's really saying. But um, so I think correlation between is this particular graph going to be harder than a straight line graph, or not straight line, but a, a kind of a standard line graph? Not necessarily. They may give you this, but then if you've gotten your way through it, they can give you some relatively moderate questions, whereas they can take a line graph and then make you do some, uh, some inference on it. So um, I, we do expect it to be just as, if not more, question stem driven than it is graph driven, if that makes sense. Right, right. Okay, well, I think we have time for just two more questions, Brian. Um, next question is coming from a Beat the GMAT member named uh, Priyanka. And your key takeaways, can you explain a little bit, can you explain in more detail what you mean by relative math? Yeah, great question. This one, um, this is a snippet of our overall integrated reasoning lesson, and so we do a full section on relative math. Um, relative math, because the, oh, sorry, I'm not an illuminate, I can't necessarily type on this. I'll explain it, and hopefully it, uh, it comes across um, somewhat visually. One of the other interesting things just about um, integrated reasoning as a section is that it's going to be more authentically driven, um, where they're not going to pick numbers that automatically give you a 3, 4, 5 ratio triangle or, you know, a lot of, of GMAT math. If you take the first two or three steps, it looks ugly, but then everything factors out and you get integers. Here, it's going to be pretty much authentic data. And so you'll have, instead of something like 52,000 divided by 13,000, where you're going to get an even four, you may end up with 51,716 divided by um, 13,120. Right, so a little less than 52,000 divided by a little bit more than 13,000. And in your mind, you need to say, all right, it's about four, but I know the numerator's le less and the denominator's more, so it's a little bit less than four. And that's kind of what we mean by relative math, that you don't want to perform the calculation until you have to, but if you can still see that same type of you know, factors and multiples, ratios, same kind of thought process that helps but on the, the kind of the pure quant section. Here it's, it'll still be rewarded, but the numbers will look more authentic. They won't all be rounded off integers or um, you know, pure divisibility factor multiple related, but you're still going to want to use that same style of thinking where you can get away with knowing this fraction is a little less than four, this fraction is a little bit more than four. So the second one is bigger and only until I have two fractions that are both just a little bit more than four do I ever really do the math. So does that make sense? That's kind of what we're getting off. We've got a few demonstrations in our lesson on that where um, you may be tempted because the numbers seem complicated to throw them into the calculator and see what comes out. But you can usually, um, you know, from what we've seen, use that relative math to be able to say, you know, I don't even need to put any of them in. This is the only one that happens to be above five. The others are close to five but below. So this is the, the greatest value. Great. Well, uh, hopefully that answers the question, Priyanka. Um, great question. And uh, so for the last question, this is actually a little bit outside the box in the sense that it's emissions related. And, uh, you know, Brian, maybe you can speculate uh, this, this answer for Shweta. Her question is, is it safe to assume that for the next six, to, six months to one year that the integrated reasoning section will not really impact admissions decisions for B schools as long as you do not perform absolutely terribly on it? Yeah, that's, um, I'm, always, I'm always leery with the phrase, is it safe to assume? But in this case, I'd, I'd say yes. This is, um, you know, we, like I mentioned before, I think three-fifths of the reason you're taking this right now is to justify the scoring system for, uh, for future students and future admissions decisions. Um, the other part of it is um, sort of like the essays became where um, I think, you know, it was 82% of people score four or better, so it's more kind of a path fail. Um, I think if you put in a reasonable effort and, uh, and you, know, don't, you know, don't show up with a score of a, a one um, or maybe a two, depending on how the scoring system breaks down, uh, it shouldn't hurt your candidacy. And I think you can read into that um, based on the fact that they're updating the percentiles monthly. 
um, which kind of goes to show they don't really know what they have yet. They meaning the, uh, the people at GMAC. They, um, you know, I, I know, you know, I've met with them, and I've been there for that. I, you know, I respect them more than and pretty much any other educational arm I know. So it isn't any any knock on them. They're just really thorough when they put these things together. And so I think they would even advise business schools um, collect the information and put it into a database, and then two years from now see how well it correlates with how people did in school. Um, but I, I'd be really surprised if you know, anyone above, say, the, you know, the 30th percentile on this has any school look at it and say, now nah, 45th percentile, integrated reasoning, we don't want you. Um, because even over the, the first few months, those percentiles are going to be swinging back and forth, um, at least significantly enough that the, the authors of the test know they, they need to account for it. So, um, so to answer the question, I guess, in, in short words, yeah, I think that's a pretty fair assumption. I wouldn't say blow it off, um, but I also, like I mentioned with the, the triathlon analogy before, you're not going to get into business school on the strength of this score. So um, I wouldn't, you know, if it's a, a matter of you know, uh, parceling out mental stamina and energy and all those things on test day, um, I wouldn't stress this very much at all. Give it, give it your best effort, but um, you know, make sure that you know that the, the quantum verbal sections are what are really going to count for anyone applying this fall and even next fall. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's more important to not post a bad score than it is to post a great score. Great. We've been uh, speaking with Brian Galvin, who is the Director of Academic Programs at Veritas Prep and also the official triathlete for Veritas Prep. And, uh, and you know, beat the GMAT. <laughs> and beat the GMAT as well until I, uh, you know, start working out again, Brian. Uh, and, uh, you know, Brian has gone through a really great lesson um, on graphics interpretation, which is a new question type in the new integrated reasoning section that is going to appear on the GMAT uh, starting June 5th. And uh, we heard uh, his great lesson as well as had him answer a couple of your audience questions. And unfortunately, we're out of time at this point. But if you have further questions on integrated reasoning, uh, you know, we do have a new GMAT integrated reasoning forum on Beat the GMAT, and Veritas Prep just so happens to be uh, one of the most active uh, set of teachers that we have um, in our forum today, uh, including Brian as well as Bill. Uh, check out the and check out, check out their profiles and be sure to follow those guys as well. And um, well, you know, a couple of things I want to mention to you about Veritas Prep. So obviously, uh, as you could tell from Brian's lesson today, they have some exceptional teachers there. Um, one of the top uh, GMAT companies in the world today. And uh, not only that, one of the most generous companies too. So uh, Veritas Prep has a very special promotion for Beat the GMAT webinar attendees today. So uh, because you guys came to the session, uh, they're offering two really great packages. One is if you purchase a three school comprehensive admissions uh, counseling package or three schools or more, you'll get a free GMAT live online full course for free. So that's $1,150 worth of uh, live online full course um, for free, which is a tremendous value. Uh, so be sure to check that out by going to veritasprep.com, looking at those packages. And, um, and the, additionally, the second offer that they have is if you enroll in any in-person GMAT course, it's 50% off, uh, which, you know, that's a pretty crazy discount. Uh, someone crazy, obviously, uh, set up that deal because it's uh, <laughs> very generous. Uh, so we thank Veritas Prep for that. So the way to get that, uh, you can call Veritas Prep 800-925-7727. Mention Beat the GMAT and these special offerings, and uh, you know they'll be able to hook you up with that. And we will be sending a follow-up email after the session to people who signed up uh, with these details. So don't feel like you had to furiously write down uh, all these details. Um, so thank you to Veritas Prep for this incredible promotion for our webinar attendees. And Brian, thank you so much for spending your evening with us and talking about graphics interpretation. No, this has been fun. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks everybody for the opportunity. At, at the peak, we had about 200 people in here, which is, uh, is pretty, we try not to keep our class sizes that big. On <laughs> uh, one of the bigger crowds I've gotten to talk to, so thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, certainly. Uh, my count was actually 250 at one point, so a really great oh, audience. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks, thanks to the audience members for being so interactive and for sending us all your questions. And we hope that we get to see you uh, for the rest of this week. Again, we have uh, a series on integrated reasoning we're hosting every day, 8 o'clock Eastern time. Tomorrow we're going to be deep diving multi-source reasoning. So that's a session that um, 
you definitely can't miss. Uh, put your t favorite TV shows on DVR and be sure to join us at 8 o'clock Eastern to learn about multi-source reasoning. So uh, thanks again to Brian. Thanks again to our audience. And we hope to see you at a future event. Take care, guys.